Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Texas Developmental Screening and Surveillance ECHO brought to you by UT Health San Antonio ECHO in collaboration with the Texas Department of State Health Services. And for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, welcome. My name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be facilitating today's session. Some housekeeping before we begin. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, email, and affiliation into the chat. To access the chat feature, please click on the speech bubble icon on the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. Please stay muted unless you're speaking, and we do encourage you to speak. Your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom controls. You can also use the emotions menu on the bottom right of your Zoom screen to raise your hand and indicate you have a question or a comment to share. You can also use the chat to share your perspectives. Please do keep your comments brief to allow everyone to a, ch a chance to share. We encourage everyone to join by video, especially for the discussion portion of this session in the latter half. That said, regardless of how you've shown up here, we are just happy you're here to learn alongside us. We are recording these sessions for later distribution on our website. Any information you put in the chat will not be shared in the recording. A little bit about the space, Echoes thrive on conversations that acknowledge and include the perspectives of many. So we welcome your questions, your experiences, and your perspective in all of our discussions. Remember, we're all learners and teachers in this space, so your contribution matters. We follow a pretty standard structure for these sessions, starting with introductions of the hub, and then a brief evidence-based didactic on a key topic related to a developmental screening. This will be followed by some announcements from the ECHO team. Following that, a member of this learning community will be presenting a case using a structured form developed for this ECHO and highlight questions they might have for this group. We will then discuss the case as a group. This is really the heart of all Teach All Learn model of ECHO and the space for you to share your own challenges, strategies, resources, and lessons learned with your peers and colleagues. We'll then wrap up this session with a quick summary of recommendations by a member of our HUD team. Towards the end of the session, the ECHO team will send out a link to a post-session survey Please fill it out. This gives us some feedback on how to refine and shape these sessions to address your priorities. With that, we will move on to some introductions. Andrea? Hello, I'm Andrea Horton. I am the Executive Director of Champions for Children in Tyler, Texas. And so I am glad to see friendly faces that I know and have you guys join um, the session today. Thank you so much for joining us today. Wiki Davis? Hello, I am Vicki. I am the Director for New Life Early Education here in Tyler, Texas, and uh, I partner quite a bit with Champions for Children in regards to our uh, little ones here, and so I am excited to be here and um, ready to learn. Thank you so much for joining us, Vicki. And with that, we will move on to our didactics. Andrea, you can take it away whenever you're ready. All right. I think you can see my screen now. Trey, yes. is everything good? Okay, Great. perfect. So today um, we are going to delve a little bit more into the whole overall concept of developmental surveillance, also known as developmental monitoring and screening. And so the CDC has um, some programs that are a part of this, as well as if some of you are involved with Help Me Grow, um, quickly go through Disclosures, um, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of my own and don't reflect the official views or policies of the UT Health San Antonio. Um, and also, just so you know, I am a Learn the Science Act Early Ambassador for the state of Texas, and some of the materials um, I'll present here today are from that. Um, that is through the CDC. Also, we want to do have an unconscious bias disclosure. So the UT Health San Antonio ECHO recognizes that language is constantly evolving. And while we may make every effort to avoid bias and stigmatizing terms, we acknowledge that an intentional lapses may occur in our presentations and we value your feedback and encourage you to share any concerns related to language images or concepts that may be offensive or stigmatizing. Your input will help us refine and improve our presentations 
ensuring that they remain inclusive and respectful to participants. And so we're, we're glad to be able to talk about this concept today. Um, we are gonna talk about a framework for children's healthy development. Um, this is based, this presentation today will be based on the work of the Center for Disease Control's Learn the Signs Act Early and also part of the Help Me Grow National Center. You can find this, um, this, this paper and I'm, there we go. I've got it printed and ready. Um, I love it. I think it's a great overall, um, great for overall understanding and developing a framework for how you're going to address um, the children's development and the in the work that you may be doing. So you can see the QR code. You're welcome to download the full framework, the whole document, and really dig in a little bit more. And next month, we are going to dig in even deeper on this idea of family-engaged developmental monitoring and what does it really mean to be family-engaged. But we'll talk about that just a little bit today. And so what is the framework? You know, we talk about healthy development, we talk about um, what children should be doing at certain ages, and, and it can get overwhelming pretty quickly. And so um, I love this concept because it breaks it down into five really um, sim similar but distinct different st steps that we can take to make sure that we are addressing the overall well-being of our children. So the first three are universal strategies. These should be done with all children through all families. So every child is developing, they're growing. We are not born knowing everything we're gonna know. And so um, things come up, you know, you can go to your one year checkup and things be fine. By the time you go to your two year checkup, there may be something that's come up that's a concern. So you can't just make the decision if it's once and done. This is an ongoing constant um, discussion that we're having. And so we're gonna talk about developmental promotion, family engaged developmental monitoring, and then screening, and then even healthy children, even children that there's no concerns about should engage in these strategies. But then we do have some targeted strategies. What do you do whenever you find a concern, whenever you see a concern, whenever you do a screening and you realize that, um, wait, there may be a speech delay here or a language delay here, um, or even um, we're beginning to see some of the red flags for autism. What do we do? How do we help these families? Um, and work alongside them to, to co-develop the treatment plan that's going to help that child uniquely be successful. So to start it off, we have developmental promotion. It's just the provision of information, materials, and tools for families to learn what to expect as their child grows so that they can engage their child in age-appropriate activities, celebrate milestones, and recognize when there are concerns. And I think the key here is celebrating milestones. For a lot of our kids, we're just going to be going, that's amazing. You, you know, you rolled over, you said your first word, you took your first step. We say that we celebrate that. And those are the milestones that, that we can celebrate. Um, and a lot of our kids are going to celebrate those milestones exactly when they need to. And our parents need that confirmation. Um, parents come to us and say, I am so worried. I don't know if I'm missing something. And so when we can celebrate and say, hey, look at what your child did. This was an age appropriate developmental milestone that your child just met. And it's a big deal um, that they did it. That really helps those parents begin to, to, to understand better what they should be looking for. Also to do age appropriate activities, just like you wouldn't give a, a six month old a steak um, because it's not age appropriate. What activities can you do with your six month old with your two-year-old, with your five-year-old. It's gonna help them and build the foundation for them to have healthy growth and development. And so developmental promotion is just putting the message out there that the things that you do matter, <laughs> that being involved in your child's life makes a difference. Um, and so, and, and that there are milestones. So we often, you know, wanna say, my child will learn at their own pace. And, and, and that's true to a certain degree, but there are certain things that all children should be able to do. And so, you know, just getting out there. So these are some examples, learn the signs, act early materials. Um, there's so many apps out there now. Um, I'm hearing about them all the time. So, you know, there's Room, there's Bright by Text, the basics, the CDC milestone tracker app. And then just in the last couple of weeks, I've been hearing more about the Sparkler app. Um, they're all designed to give parents at just that, that little bit of a piece of information get their attention, get them um, 
you know, thinking about developmental things, thinking about interactions, and then um, kind of giving them some information that they can move forward with. And so, um, so apps and, and apps and messaging and all the things that are, are in real time, these apps find out when your child's birthday is. Um, and so they're telling you things at two months. This is what a two month old should do at six months. Um, this is what a six month old should do. And so you're not having to remember it for a long time. But then there's also um, developmental health events. Um, if if help, help Me Grow calls them books, balls and blocks at Champions for Children, we call it the baby block party. But you're just going out and engaging the children, engaging the families, going to community fairs and saying, hey, development, developmental milestones matter. So I'm going to show you this. This. Well, this is the CDC Learn the Science Act Early Materials. You can see there's an app. There's a booklet that you can get with the entire first five years. And I tell parents, use this as your baby's first diary. This is something you can remember that um, you'll go back and you'll be like, oh, look at that two month checklist and how you did those things. That's really sweet. Um, or you can just get one month or one checklist at a time off of the CDC website. But then this is also um, part of Bright by Text. And so I know we have a state uh, movement to utilize Bright by Text, um, but I just wanted to show this, this video to say how easy it is to promote developmental health. Can you hear? No, Andrea, we can't hear it. Okay. Okay, I mean, I know exactly what to do. I know exactly what I did wrong. And so I'm going to do it again. Let me go. It, it, it makes you form. Okay, mm. here we go. Let's try it again. Get this. Andrea, stories, uh, we are not seeing your screen. It makes you smarter. Right. So if you could go back and share. One more slide. time. I see what I'm doing. Okay. We're going to get this, friends. We are in this together. And we're going to watch this video and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> All right. Can you see the screen now? Okay. Now I'm going to play it. Build your, gonna brain, get your brain. Brain. Your brain. Here we go. Hmm. Get this. When I tell you stories, it makes you smarter. Right. The cadence builds your brain. Right. Well, it, it, it makes you form neural connections. Right. Um, uh, okay, uh, your brain is in your head. Right. Raising little ones is a big job. Get free tips by texting the word Texas Kids to the number 274448. So you don't have to spend a whole lot of time, uh, give a whole lot of details with developmental promotion. You're just saying it matters and the things that you do matter. Um, and then we move on to developmental monitoring. And so I really believe in a, in a level of care approach where we use the lightest touch. What's the least amount of information that I can give you that's gonna get you where you need to go? And so if you can just say, your brain is in your head and the things that you do with your child build their brain power. Um, for a lot of parents, that's all they, that, that may be really, really good and enough to encourage them. But even again, these are universal for families to be involved in developmental monitoring. And so within family engaged developmental monitoring, you take those ideas and those concepts that you talk about in developmental pr promotion and intentionally making sure that the family recognizes that they need to be engaged in the process. And so one of the keys to this is that families are regarded as the experts on their child's development. Um, you know, a lot of times I hear and more and more lately that that you need to be a professional to do that or to know that or to say that. Development is something that has been happening. And for many, many, many of our families, they're, they're, they're nervous. They don't know if they know. They don't know what they don't know. And they are afraid they're gonna miss something. And, and they just need that confidence boost that you, um, you mom, you know your child best. And when you see something and when you're concerned about something, go find some answers for that. And that includes both the, the caregiver, if you're a Help Me Grow caregiver, if you're a daycare caregiver, listening to that parent and addressing their concerns. It also includes encouraging, like I said, those parents to say, you are the expert on your child and you have the answers um, and, and we can discover this together. Um, 
And so we want to listen to the families. Um, you want to provide the information in a holistic approach. So you're going to take into account the family support. What's happening in that family structure? Who does that child live with? Who may be influencing them? Their culture and any cultural differences that, that may impact what they do or how they would, would like to go about addressing the concerns, um, their faith, and then there are social determinants of health. So things like, do you have transportation? Do you have insurance? Do you, um, is dad working or not working? Who, who is staying home um, and taking care of the child? Or are, are both parents working? How are we going to help this family um, take the time and find the time to really spend some time do, doing some developmental monitoring. And then again, it's not a one and done. Development is discussed over time. So you're gonna present these ideas over and over again, a little bit at a time. That's why those apps and those texts, even more today than ever before are important because it tells you in real time, this should be happening to your child right now. Um, and you don't have to think about what might be gonna happen in six months or two years. And then we move on to developmental screening. So at certain ages, we are going to use standardized validated measurements, um, screening tools. The Amer American Academy of Pediatrics recommends, and if you, you're taking your children to well checks, they are gonna get a screening at nine, 18, 30 months. If you have children in your care, if you're a daycare teacher, um, when these key, key ages come, talk to the parents. Did you get a developmental screening? Have you gone to the well check? Um, make sure that you ask the questions if you have a concern, but also anytime there's a concern, even if it's not, if it's nine, 18 and 30 months, you should take the time to get a developmental screening. The great thing is um, most of the standardized screenings are multi available in multiple languages and Love this. They address both the achievements and the concerns. So again, we're going to celebrate the great things that are happening. This is how we promote developmental screening. So we just hired someone on our staff who is going to provide free developmental screenings. And so we say, do you have questions, concerns, or are you just curious about your child's development? You don't have to think there's something wrong. Um, just You're just curious. I'd just like to know if my child is where they need to be. Call us and we'll talk you through it. And so those are the universal strategies. Every child, every family needs to be engaged in promotion, monitoring, and screening. But then what do you do whenever uh, uh, delays are identified, whenever you, um, you know, that, that question, that concern comes up, you do that screening, they get marked, um, scored. Again, this is uh, evidence-based it's a scored screening. So you can see your child is at risk. Your child is delayed. Um, and now what are we gonna do about it? And so our targeted strategies really target those kids and those families who have real concerns. Um, and so the, the best thing that you can do is maintain an updated list of services in your community. So before you ever do a screening, you're gonna ask yourself, what am I gonna do if the child that I screen actually has a delay. What information am I gonna give that parent to help them along the lines? Because it's very defeating as a parent to be told your child has a speech delay, you probably need to do something about that. And then you walk away and the parent is left to figure it all out by themselves. So what kind of services are available in your community? Knowing how ECI works, knowing how the school district works, and you don't have to know everything about it, but just making sure that you know the basics to be able to give them some direction and how to go. Um, also really engaging the family to identify the family's priorities and match referrals to those priorities. So there are times when children may be delayed in every area and that family may not be able to address every need right that minute. So how can you talk to that family? What do you think mom and dad, grandma, is most important that you address first. Let's figure that out. And then let's make those referrals. And then co-determining co the level of support the family needs to make a successful connection to services. Um, so how much, how knowledgeable are they about the city that you live in, about the services that are available? If if you say, you know, let's talk, we, we decide our this child has a speech delay, 
Will they be able to know how to do it? How Who to call? Will they be able to know what to say? Will they be able to get to that appointment? Will they be able to pay for that appointment? And so taking all of those things into consideration and being able to offer that family support to help find the resources that's really gonna help them help their child. But then the last one, the number five being the receipt of services. And we live in a super fast paced world. Um, and we often just put things in people's laps and say, good luck, I hope that you are able to get the services that you need. Um, here, here's the list of 800 places that you can call. And we never follow back up with them. And so being sure, taking that full circle approach where we wanna make sure that those families are able to receive the services. Number one, you wanna make sure that the referrals you're giving are good referrals. We talk about that in our, our office a lot. If we don't wanna be referring to people inappropriately, and that doesn't mean that they're doing anything bad, but if we thought they could treat speech delays, but they really speak or really address physical delays or cognitive delays, and we're sending a whole bunch of people to somebody for speech delays, and they're just having to tell them over and over and over again, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. That's not the kind of therapy we have. Then we want to stop doing that, right? You don't. We don't want to waste our family's time looking, going down pathways that we could send them in a better pathway. And so we also want to respond to any concerns that they have. So give them a minute. Let, let them think about what y'all have talked about. It's hard for parents to admit that their child has a delay, but, um, you know, give them a minute and then talk through it with them. Help them to know that it's going to be okay, that we're going to figure this out together, um, that they're not in this all alone. And then just follow up with them. Were you able to get in did they, were they able to help you? Was it a good referral? Were they able to make a difference? And then if the child is on a waiting list and if your community is anything like ours, we have long waiting lists sometimes. Um, what can they do in the meantime? What can they do at home that might help with that? And I love that the screener that we use has a long list of items that you can just kind of check off. These three things, these five things, or something that you can do at home that's going to help with your child's speech and language, that's going to help with your child's fine motor skills. And um, here's some things that you can do. And in fact, we um, just finished a, a full research project where we were doing developmental screenings in daycares in our community. And most of the parents said, you gave me things to do at home. And those things made all the difference. And about 80% of the kids, some of them did go to professional services, but they were able to get to move up either from delayed to at risk or at risk to um, on target. And many of them, it was just because of some things that they were able to do at home. Um, and then again, full circle, ask about new achievements. Have you seen any change, um, new concerns? Is something else coming up? Because again, development is ongoing. So just because you address one, one concern doesn't mean that another won't pop up. You've got to stay vigilant and, and pay attention and do that developmental monitoring piece that we talked about. So those are the five different components of our framework. Um, we do those things and then we do them again and then we do them again and then we do them again. And so um, as a child grows up, the adults in his or her life are able to have these conversations and they're able to say, what's going on? What's getting better? What's not working out for this child? What can we do? What adjustments can we make? And whenever they're talking to each other, when you as a caregiver are talking to the parent, the parent's talking to the doctor, the doctor is communicating back to the um, community services. What can we do to help this child be successful? Um, then that child has a full village around them who is able to um, really understand and dig in deep onto what that child needs um, in order to thrive, which is what we really want. Um, and so that those are the five different areas. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Do you have any questions real quick? And then I think we'll do the case study. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this wonderful presentation. It's a, it's a great, great introduction when we're thinking about frameworks for developmental screening and surveillance. So I will open up at the floor for any questions from our learning community here.
maybe I'll get started and let's, you know, uh, get the ball rolling. So uh, you mentioned, I think in one of the slides, while we're talking about referrals, uh, uh, to consider family priorities. How, I mean, could you give me an example of, you know, where a family priority kind of played a role in how you perhaps, you know, made a referral or, you know, considered, like, how did you bring that in when you were deciding what referrals to provide? Right. So, so one of the groups that we do work with is with children with autism and helping their families develop a treatment plan. And we, um, we send them out and help them find the different evaluations that they need to get a good diagnosis. And then we help them work through that, that treatment plan, what's going to be best. So just getting a diagnosis isn't really the be all end all. Now we want to address the concern that we have. And so um, as, as I've sat in and we do a care team conference, a multidisciplinary meeting of psychologists, psychiatrists, um, ABA providers, educational advocates, we always ask the family, so what's next? What's most important for you? And um, depending on the age, depending on the um, severity of the condition, and depending on just what's important to that family um, and what that family wants, we, we begin making those referrals. So sometimes our families, we may say, you know, is your child in school? No, my child hasn't been in school because of their condition for a really long time. Well, then we ask, do you want, do you think your child, you would want your child to go back to school? Is that even an option that you're considering? And if they say no, then we start looking for referrals outside of going back to the public school system or going back into the private, a private system. If they say yes, um, but I don't think my child's ready to go back to public school right now, then we help them figure out what private options might be available. Um, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll have referrals that say, okay, you know, you have, again, several conditions that are happening all at the same time. This one is the highest priority. Um, if you can treat this one first, then some of the others may by default just get better. But also within that, you really have to take into it the family dynamic and what may be going on in that family. So if there's some social emotional concerns alongside of some cognitive concerns, and let's say that family may be going through a separation or a divorce. Well, as much as we want to address the cognitive concerns, the social emotional concerns may, may take priority. And so working with that family to identify what is most important to do right now. Um, and, and again, treating the family as the expert. And so, um, asking for their opinions and then responding in such a way that that you value what they have to say and what they think is important for their child. And I always trust that, you know, if I think you should go to speech therapy and you think you should go to occupational therapy, if I send you to the occupational therapist, they're probably going to send you over to the speech therapist. It's, it's going to get itself worked out. Um, but in the end, honoring that family's priorities. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was, uh, yeah. Um, I, I see a question here, of, uh, or a comment rather from ha Haley. Uh, coming from an RBD background and having a son that is autistic, I try and use my personal professional experiences to help further assist the family and taking in information mm -hmm. that could benefit me. Thank you so much yeah, for sharing that. So yeah, this this has been a great discussion. I would welcome everyone to please uh, continue sharing your comments and questions in the chat, uh, but keeping uh, uh, the timing in mind, we will move on to the next part of our session. Karen, uh, could you please bring up the announcements? And once again, thank you, Andrea, for that wonderful presentation and discussion. So, um, to claim your credits for today, uh, we are offering free free TechPets credits certificates for this session. If you would like to request one, please scan this QR code. Uh, we will drop this link in the chat as well. Please note that you do need a TechPets account before claiming the certificates. You will receive these certificates by email. Next slide. Would you like to present a case at our next session? Cases can describe a challenge that you are presently facing with a child in your care. These challenges could be around screening, intervention, referrals, 
Uh, you do not have to prepare any formal presentation. We will provide you with a simple case form and you can submit a case using the link in the chat. Next slide, please. Our next session is on Friday, November 8th. Uh, this was the only session where we had, we moved to the third Friday of the month, but starting next month, we will continue with our regular cadence on the sec second Friday of each month at 1 p.m. Central. So please do join us. And with that, we will move on uh, to our case presentation. Um, while Karen brings up I do uh, the case, I do want to remind everyone that no protected health information is allowed when we are discussing a case of either the chat or discussion, and that includes names, emails, addresses, birth dates, or any information that can easily identify an individual. We also want to make the space welcoming and inclusive for everyone. So when we are discussing today, let us all avoid any bias or use of any stigmatizing terms. And with that, I will leave the floor to you, Vicky. And Karen, can you please bring up the case? Thank you so much. Vicky, you can take it away. Um, hi, I'm Vicki Davis. I am the director at New Life Early Education in Tyler. And uh, this case study uh, that I want to present today um, is extremely interesting. Um, I have not put in all of the de details. I wanted to share some uh, things that are not in the report. But um, the child presented to us um, about 8 um, August of 22. And they came with a speech delay, extreme meltdowns. Um, even to the point they would pull their hair, um, scratch, bite. Um, I honestly did not know if this child was going to make it in our facility. Uh, they were a runner. Uh, they threw shoes. Um, it was so different than just a regular uh, meltdown or temper tantrum. Um, so I reached out to champions and they came in, they did an observation for us. We sat down and we started to do the success plan. And at that point in time, we started asking the parents um, all of the background questions, um, normal birth, uh, no trauma at birth, um, it, all of those things. Um, then something presented interesting. At about six months, the family was in a major car accident. Um, the car did flip a couple of times. Uh, no one was ejected. A uh, child was secured in the safety seat. Um, but upon arrival to the hospital, no testing was done to the child. Uh, the testing was done to the parent that was in the vehicle, but not particularly to the child. They did a, a, an overall examination, but nothing in depth. They did not see anything that uh, warranted any further testing. Um, so the observer with Champions found that very interesting. And so we, um, we set up, um, uh, they set up a consultation with the pediatrician and was describing the behaviors and um, uh, what we were doing to help with those behaviors. And um, the doctor went ahead and referred them to a doctor in Dallas and they decided to go ahead and do an MRI. Um, now, at this point in time, um, the child is almost uh, about two and a half almost, on the verge of three. And they did discover that the child had six lesions in, uh, uh, in different parts of the brain. They weren't just in uh, one area. And they did decide that the lesions were... Um, conclusive with what we would consider shaken baby syndrome. And so this was a huge eye opening 
uh, revelation for all of us because this child had severe trauma and it was uh, cognitively uh, slowing down the developmental process. And so now we just had to kind of step back we had to figure out what resources they needed, uh, definitely needed uh, speech therapy, needed occupation therapy. And so uh, Champions was able to uh, give, give some referrals in that area along with the pediatrician. And, um, and so also the child has, uh, they did not discover um, until about a year ago that the child had a tongue tie. And so the tongue tie was also uh, part of this, the speech issue and uh, they're in food therapy as well. Um, And so this child had absolutely no way of uh, being able to control their emotions or their, um, or their ability to regulate how they processed their feelings. And so we just really had to start from the ground up and we had to uh, build trust with the child. We had to build trust with the parents. We had to, um, lots of positive redirection. Um, a lot of the child's frustration came with the fact that their speech was delayed. So we worked repetitively on speech. Um, but the one thing that, um, that I want to say is not only did we suggest therapy for the child, but we also suggested therapy for the parent. And the reason is, is because the parent had so much guilt for not uh, seeing these things, um, not following through to make sure that the child had been properly taken care of um, at the time of the incident. And so we had to encourage them that this was not their fault, um, that um that we could get them to the resources that they need. But not only was the the therapy and the resource for the child, but it was for the the parent as well. And so the parent and the child actually do uh, co-therapy together. And um, the child has made an absolutely remarkable turnaround. Um, Speech is so much better. They're completely verbal. They're learning how to regulate their emotions um, uh, through different coping mechanisms. Meltdowns are almost non-existent. And uh, the child is in our pre-K program and is absolutely thriving. So I I just want to encourage everyone, use the resources that you have available to you. to me here in Tyler, Champions is one of our big, biggest resources, biggest advocates. And um, I am so grateful that um, we have such an incredible resource available to us. I also wanna say, don't give up on a child because there's usually some reason behind the behavior. And it may take a little time to find it, um, but once you discover it, then you understand how you can help them deal with it. Thank you so much, Vicki, for bringing this uh, very, very interesting and challenging case. Um, I want to open up the floor for any questions you may have for Vicki. I have a quick question for Vicki. Um, you're you're describing this case, and it sounds quite complicated. <laughs> and you know, you kind of had to do some detective work to figure out what was going on. Um, how did you did you ever get nervous when you were dealing with it, and and or did you just feel confident that you had the answers for that family? 
Well, I can say going into it, I didn't have any answers. <laughs> so um, I, I did not have, um, I, I was not very confident in the fact, number one, that she was even going to make it through the program. Uh, but once we were able to discover that there was a real issue there, then then we were able to narrow down what resources we needed. And with that, I became very confident that we could get this child exactly where they needed to be. Right. I think that's so key that, you know, you don't always have, you, you try to have as many answers as possible in your back pocket, but there's always going to be that surprise thing that you go, oh, that's more than I thought it was. And, and to be but, honest, you, you also have to be very honest with a parent when you're mm -hmm. working with them and you have to tell them, look, I may not have all the answers. Um, I don't have all the answers, but we're going to try to figure this thing out together. So what is the child, what's the, their behavior like today? It is a complete 180. Um, do we still have a few issues every now and then? Of course we do, but a typical four-year-old behavior. But as for the um, severe meltdowns, shoe throwing, um, all of that is non-existent. And um, it's really because now the child has been in speech therapy long enough that they're not frustrated in the, in the part that they cannot tell you what's wrong. And so that has been a huge blessing that we have been able to improve their speech to the point that um, they can communicate. And, and I also think that's so important to note that, you know, a lot of stuff comes out as behavior in young children. And so really digging down to the root of the cause of the behavior um, when your tummy hurts, you get grumpy. When your head hurts, you get grumpy. When you feel out of control, you act out of control. And so um, digging down to figure out what, what is the root cause of the behavior and then addressing that is really what's key to, to that lasting change. Thank you. I see a question here from Patricia. Uh, what was the timeline from the start to the finish? Did you have any resistance from family or parents? Um, so the child started with us in August of 22. Um, the observation with champions was done in October of 22 and the child is still with us and is still receiving service. So our timeline has been right around two years. Um, I did not re receive any resistance from the family and it's just because mom knew that something was off, something was different, but she had no idea where to start. Mm -hmm. And that's what so many of our families tell us. I, I know something's wrong, but I don't know what to call it. I don't know how to say it. I don't know who to call and tell it to. Um, and I don't know how to know if this is something that I should be acting on or just keep continue to wait and see if it gets better. And so um, giving parents that the, the words to say um, just like our children, whenever they don't have the words to say what's going on with them, they they act out. Our parents have a hard time, actually have a hard time acting um, if they don't know and they don't have the confidence to be able to, to go to that doctor and say, hey, I'm concerned about this specific thing. And, and that's what we always tell people. That's what the screenings do, is they give you the words to be able to identify what's going on. Uh, Raquel, I, I saw you had a question. Yeah, I have a question. And actually, it's related with Andrea says and Vicky. Um, well, first, thank you so much. This is very informative. It's eye-opening for a lot of us, uh, that information. So but while you were talking about this case, I was thinking, what kind, in your experience, what kind of advice you can uh, give us to how we could help parents to identify those behaviors that are behind, like for instance, this speech delay, how we could help them to, and what kind of uh, tools we can bring parents to equip them to, yeah, they wanna be worried concerned about what it can be an act upon them. Um, in, 
in our facility, I can tell you what we do. Um, when a child presents to come to the facility, part of the paperwork that we give them is a child development list. And um, we have the, the parents fill it out. And then we look over it, we read over it, and we see, do the parents have any red flags? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times, parents are not going to understand what red flags are. Um, they can... Um, they, they just may think, well, they're just a little slower in this area. Well, really, they should have done it a couple of months ago, so they're really behind. But um, we have a baseline with the child coming in knowing, okay, we need, this is what we need to work on. These are the things that we need to work on. And then once the child has been with us a few weeks, we do our own developmental checklist, and then we compare those. And we see, uh, we get a really good baseline of knowing um, where we where we need to work, what we need to do to try to help catch them up. And then um, if we see that um, the child is just not picking things up in a timely manner, then we sit down and we have a conversation with the parent. You know, we also let them know, we all know that children develop at their own pace and things of this nature, but we are very honest with them and let them know if we see those red flags. Of course, we do it in a way that um, uh, we, we never want a parent to feel bad that their child is delayed. But um, we also know if you don't have that early intervention, um, the child is just going to get delayed more and more. Um, we give the parents homework, you know, work on um, having the child do this, have them, you know, practice, uh, you know, saying the, these words and things of that nature. We try to get the parents involved in um, the, devel de the development of their child as well. Uh, because a lot of times, especially brand new parents, they have no idea what a developmental checklist is. And they have, they just take their child to the doctor. The doctor looks at them and says, they're looking good. They're doing fine. And that's the end of it. And they don't understand the, the uh, physical development, the cognitive, the social things of that nature. And that's why I asked the question, you know, have you guys seen an increase in developmental delays coming out of COVID, because um, I can say here, um, we surely have, especially with social emotional. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And just for the fact that you involve parents from the beginning of the process, yep. And then give a homework. I love homework for everybody. I think it's, it's <laughs> always good. Uh, and I start always with me, and this is my homework. But being involved in, in those activities is so meaningful and so mindful uh, from the beginning, right? Dealing with those feelings from parents. Um, right. And don't wait until there's a problem to talk about it, you mm -hmm. know, to where they've heard this language before from you about development, developmental milestones, the importance of your children meeting developmental milestones, the importance of checklists and monitoring and screening. And those screenings really do drill down into what is the real concern here? Um, so they separate out, you know, the screenings are just, the there are the monitoring is just checklists. Um, with the CDC, they it's evidence-based and they say, if there's even one thing that your child cannot do, you need to act on this. Mm -hmm. This isn't like what a superstar child should be able to do. This is what every child should be able to do. And so if there's something on this list that your child cannot do, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to go to three years of um, occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. It may mean getting down on the floor with your child and reading to them. It may mean paying attention whenever they're doing certain things and the way they eat and the way they relate to you. Um, and so, but those screenings will drill down into which kind of delay is, is, is concerning. And then from there, you can make the right referral to get the right kind of intervention or the right kind of even at home stuff that you can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And yeah, I think our kids are going to face a lot of social emotional challenges. Mm -hmm. A lot of our kids in the last case we talked about last month, 
you know, that child had been in an apartment in New York City for two years, never left, not one time. And that that's going to have lasting impact in that child's life. And so um, being cognizant of it and aware of it and doing what we can to even even at a young age, overcome some of those things. Yeah, thank you very much. Just for the fact that it's a validation of parents' feelings and yeah. doubts and fear. That is a blessing. Yes, just right yeah. there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question here. Um, so uh, this child is about to start kinder soon. So what transition plans have been put in place? Or what are you planning? in terms of transition? We um, have been speaking with uh, parents in regards to uh, maybe after the first of the year, um, starting to get a plan together for that transition. Um, they've already contacted the school system in which they will be transitioning to, to let them know about uh, this child. Uh, about the resources, and then that way they can have a plan of action ready to go when school starts, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a 504 or uh, whatever resources are going to be needed in school. Okay. And, and what is the, like, what's the kind of care that this child is receiving from their physician right now? Um. Well, the physician just is right now monitoring uh, the referrals for occupational therapy, speech therapy, and the food therapy. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, any other questions from our uh, learners here? Or if you would like to share something, a similar case that you have had. I saw your comment, Andrea, earlier about, you know, an increase in autism rates coming out of like, which are not perhaps, you know, it's not associated with COVID. Uh, like, what are the different kind of delays that you have been seeing? Uh, if you could comment on that, like, like, have, uh, has there been any change in the, you know, in the incidence of certain kind of delays over the past few years? I don't have any specific data on that. Um, I haven't run the numbers to see, but like Vicki said, I think that social emotional and that that's that language communication is really what we're gonna find um, would be my guess at what is gonna really pick up. Just um, that, that also relates at the same time that we also really started putting our kids in front of screens. And so that screen time effect of what does it look like to grow up without, um, you know, that every time you get emotionally distraught, what does mom do? She puts a screen in front of you and plays a happy song and then you start dancing and she thinks she solved your emotional distress. Well, now she just kind of moved it. <laughs> and so um, I think we're gonna continue to see that. Um, I, I think across the spectrum, across ages, COVID is going to have an impact. I think we're going to see it in the kids who are graduating from high school, the kids who are graduating from college. We're going to see it in the kids who were in kindergarten, who's, um, you know, didn't didn't go back to school after spring break and then spent their whole first grade year. Um, that's going to have a unique impact on that grade. And then I think the kids who turned four and then five and spent their kindergarten year, a year when there's so much social emotional learning going on. Um, also, a lot of kids born during that time, their parents never got back around to putting them into school. So they're going to be starting kindergarten, um, perhaps without any formal early learning program experience, which um, is going to have an impact in that kindergarten classroom and how that classroom is going to be able to progress. So I think the interesting thing is how it's going to affect each little individual pocket of children differently. Um, and and that we, we're going to have to kind of just be aware. And I think probably for the next 18 years, we're going to be saying 
you know, that child was born during COVID, that child went to kindergarten during COVID, um, that child, um, you know, or that adult now graduated from high school, or <laughs> I graduated from high school during COVID, you know, just those social things that didn't happen to those kids. And, I, and I've watched some of the kids who, it seems like they, they didn't have graduation, they didn't have prom, they didn't have all those things. Um, and I know we're here talking about young children, but I think we can all relate to what would it have been like if you didn't get to have all of those experiences your senior year. And then at the end of the, at, four years later, many of them were graduating from college at a time when there was some social unrest and some of them didn't get to have college graduations. And so while that doesn't seem like a big deal, um, in the moment, it is a big deal. And it is going to have some 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 challenges that you're going to face. Same with our kindergartners who spent kindergarten at home in front of a computer. Um, and, and some of the things I've watched in my own children happening um, because of the, the time and the age they were in, and they didn't get to have those social engagement um, milestones that, that they needed. And um, with people with parents working from home, they are that you know, if you've tried working from home with your child at home, that that's a big challenge. And so, um, again, that screen time, I think, is going to have a really huge impact on the way that those those children who are at home with their parents, especially while their parents were working, um, if they if they weren't really, really tuned in, um, I think we're going to see some some impact on that. No, thank you. That's very insightful. And considering keeping in mind not just the kids who were born during COVID, but the different uh, stages as they progress and the different time, uh, transitions, mm -hmm. like I, it puts into perspective what I have to think about my my kid, right? So, but but thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vicky, again uh, for bringing this case to us and for this. Uh, for sharing uh, this case and uh, this presentation. Um, Andrea, I will request you if you could please uh, uh, provide us a quick summary of today's session. Absolutely. So I think the bottom line of today's session is that developmental monitoring is something we think about all the time. We don't have to, we don't have to be worried or frightful or fearful all the time, but we do need to think about it all the time. And so um, putting those messages out in front of our parents that developmental milestones matter, the th things that you do for your children and with your children matter, and then just continuing to move into deeper levels of care to where you're talking about it in general terms, then talking about it in more specific terms, then actually screening and actually identifying if there's a delay, and then what are you going to do, knowing what you're going to do if you run into a child with a delay? How are you going to help them and their parents? Um, and, make the decisions about what they're going to do, be respectful of the family situation and what their needs are. Um, and then don't just drop the ball, but finish strong and make sure that you follow back up and make sure that they actually got the care that they needed. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a great summary. And thank you all for joining uh, today's session. As a reminder, please do complete the post-session survey using the link in the chat. Um, and if you would like to request, uh, um, if you would like to request TechBest credit, uh, please do uh, use the link that we posted and we will send also that information in our post-session email that'll go out after the session. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next session, which will be on Friday, November 8th uh, at 1 p.m. Central. Have a wonderful rest of the day and have a great weekend. Thank you all.